Ethereum and virtually online. Our next installment of that series is going to be at noon on Tuesday, October 25th. And the subject of that is going to be a little bit of radio in the ring. We'll be talking about the 1938 boxing match between Alabama's Joe Lewis and German boxer Max Schmeling. And our speaker will be our very own Dot Moore, author, longtime friend of the agency with us today. Dot's working on new Lewis biography. We're very pleased to, uh, to welcome her for the next uh, installment of this lecture series on October 25th. It has been a great pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Sam Christensen. He joined the archives in uh, 2021. In the summer of 2021, he holds degrees in history from Auburn University and the University of Delaware, and he's a certified project management professional. Sam has quickly made himself indispensable to the work of the archives, and he spent much of the last year working on the research for the exhibit that you see upstairs. So it seemed quite fitting uh, that we launched this new series with Sam sharing a bit of his radio research. So he's decided to talk to us today about three of the early Alabama radio pioneers. So without further ado, Sam Christensen. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Scotty, for the kind introduction. Thank you all for being here, both in person and virtually. Uh, thank you those to the uh, those of you that are in the future watching us uh, perform this now. So, like Scotty said, I'm going to introduce you to three Alabama radio pioneers. Uh, these people pioneered radio technology in the early days of the 20th century. We do talk about all three in the exhibit, but I wanted to go a little bit into more detail of them today and perhaps personalize them a little bit more. So our first pioneer was also one of the first uh, con contributors to the radio industry. Uh, this was electrical engineer and inventor Lee DeForest. Uh, DeForest invented the triode vacuum tube in 1906, which really made radio broadcasting practical. And although much of his career was marred by various patent disputes with other engineers, uh, DeForest still called himself the father of radio and much later the grandfather of television. But well, before he was the father of anything, he was born in Council Bluffs, Iowa in 1873, and his Alabama connection came several years later when his father moved to Talladega to become the president of Talladega College. Uh, his father was a congregational minister and moved his family there in 1879, and being from the north and being so closely connected to a college for African Americans, the, the DeForests were well, the, the white population of Talladega was somewhat skeptical of DeForest. Uh, as a result, Lee spent a lot of his childhood alone on the college's campus. He made pretty good use of his time, though. Uh, DeForest credited his fascination with invention and engineering with his time spent reading about the latest patents of the day in the college's library, and he also kept tabs on the developments of the uh, great inventors of the late 19th century through that. He also learned uh, woodworking in the college's carpentry shop, and he says that was his first introduction to mechanics and kind of a neat turn of the century turn of phrase. One of his earliest adventures off of campus was actually a trip to a new blast furnace that was about a mile, mile outside of uh, Talladega city limits. In his autobiography, DeForest talks about just being absolutely captivated by the process of this blast furnace being built, and every spare moment he got he would try to venture out and watch the workers build it. And after it was completed, he would watch them work it until he mostly understood the step-by-step the -step process of how the blast furnace worked. And DeForest did what a lot of young boys would do and decided he wanted his own blast furnace. Uh, anyone's related to an engineer or perhaps knew an engineer during formative years, you can probably tell something's about to be broken and you'd be right. Uh, he ended up building a scaled-down version of the blast furnace using materials around his family's house. Critically, it relied on a set of antique bellows that uh, was apparently a family heirloom and had been in the family for some time. Uh, DeForest succeeded in melting lead with his furnace, which means he got it up to at least 620 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty impressive for a 10-year-old. Unfortunately, the bellows melted, the, uh, the tip melted, and... Okay. His family decided that it would probably be best if, if Lee pursued his interest elsewhere and shut down the blast furnace. And in any case, the, the, the blast furnace that inspired him closed a few years later. He also had another formative moment when he visited the Shelby Iron Works, uh, which is well to the southwest of Talladega, sort of in the central part of the state. Uh, luckily for his parents' antique collection, it wasn't so much the foundry equipment that inspired him, but rather the steam locomotive that was resting in the uh, foundry's rail yard. 
He was specifically interested in how the locomotive could change directions. He knew it had something to do with this bar in the engineer's cab called a reverser handle. So he climbed up in the engineer's cab and traced the mechanical links from the reverser bar all the way down where he was crawling underneath the locomotive to find this reverser gear, which is ultimately how it changed directions. So he took all of this information, this close study of the locomotive, to build a wooden mock-up of a locomotive in his parents' yard. It didn't actually work. No one was injured, no one was hurt. It was very safe. But it did serve to attract the attention of his neighbors and apparently sort of introduced his family a little bit closer to them. <laughs> All of this is to say that DeForest had a unique childhood. Uh, his access to the college's resources at just such an early age was very formative to his interest in engineering. And even though his father really wanted him to follow in his footsteps and attend seminary, DeForest persuaded him that it, he would be better off as an engineer, particularly in the then pretty new field of electrical engineering. So Lee left Talladega to attend Mount Hermon Prep School up in Massachusetts, and he attended Yale after that. He stuck around until 1899 when he finished his dissertation on Hertzian waves and received a PhD in engineering. His career in earnest really began in wireless telegraphy. His, his first invention was a development of Marconi's uh, wireless transmitter, which roughly doubled the speed at which you could transmit things wirelessly. Unfortunately, DeForest's invention happened to coincide with him visiting a man named Reginald Fess Fessenden's lab, who was a Canadian-born wireless inventor as well, uh, working in New York at the time. And this really spawned uh, DeForest's first patent controversy. And the courts ultimately ruled in favor of Fessenden in 1905. So this was kind of a trend for DeForest, where he would have some success, but it was always checkered with a few lawsuits and oftentimes his business partners embezzling money or scamming stockholders, things like that. Uh, he left the company in 1905 to pursue his own work in broadcasting. It only took him a year or so to hit pay dirt. Uh, he invented this, which is the first triode vacuum tube in 1906. He called it the Audion and secured a patent for it in 1907. And that same year, he actually started doing these experimental broadcasts from his laboratory in New York City. But as I mentioned earlier, DeForest's success was always a little bit checkered. And here the issue was that in retrospect, it's clear that he didn't fully understand how the triode worked. He intended it mostly as a way to detect electrical signals, but he didn't really realize it could be used to amplify electrical signals as well, which is sort of the magic ingredient that lets uh, radio broadcasting become practical. So just to talk a little bit about vacuum tubes and that, as you can see, it looks something like a light bulb. Uh, it's actually used to control and amplify electrical current. Uh, it features three elements, which is where the phrase tri or the prefix tri comes from. Uh, you have a cathode that shoots electricity into the tube, a grid which can be powered off and on to either shut off or amplify the electrical current, and then you have an anode that can receive it. All of this occurs in a vacuum, and hence the name vacuum tube. And when amplified, these radio transmissions can be carried over a much greater distance with much greater clarity compared to an older, say, crystal detector. And uh, when you receive the signals, they can be played with greater volume through a speaker. The issue with the forest early patents is they were very leaky. They were vacuum tubes that weren't quite vacuums. Some claim that this was a way to get around some other patent issues, but DeForest always blamed his lab assistant for not being very good at making vacuum tubes for uh, why they didn't work as well. Triodes, it has to be said, would define electronics for the next half century and until they began to be replaced by transistors. But it really took the work of another engineer, a man named Edwin Armstrong, to realize their full potential. Armstrong wrote the scientific paper back in 1912 theorizing that a triode could be used to amplify signals. Uh, DeForest began experimenting with just that after reading the paper, and at about the same time as Armstrong succeeded in those experiments, DeForest succeeded as well. And this began a 19-year legal battle between Armstrong and DeForest to see who really deserved the credit. So on one hand, DeForest had invented the triode, but on the other, Armstrong understood the science behind it a little bit better. The battle really went back and forth. Uh, both claimants won different cases in different courts, but every time the other one would appeal, and then it would just be escalated to a slightly higher court. Uh, by the 1930s, they were in the US Supreme Court, and they ultimately ruled in DeForest's favor in 1934. So DeForest won the legal battle, but 
His reputation never really recovered from this. A lot of engineers very vocally expressed their opinion that Armstrong truly deserved the credit. And DeForest really spent the rest of his life struggling to replicate these uh, early successes he's had in his career. He did some work pioneering sound on film, and I think he had about 100 patents to his name by the time he died, but he never really saw the success that he got with the, uh, the triode. When he wasn't inventing or in court, uh, DeForest criticized com the commercialization of radio. And uh, he really believed that radio should be used to promote educational programs and high culture to the masses. And he criticized what considered the excessive commercial running and you know, bad taste in music as he considered it. He wrote this uh, 1946 article in the Chicago Tribune called A Father Mourns His Child. And he wrote that someday the program director will attain the intelligent skill of the engineers who erected his towers and built the marvel which he now so ineptly uses. He was very bitter about the direction of radio, despite his contributions to the field. Our next pioneer is a slightly happier story. Uh, we have Hewlett Legrand Ansley here, or he also went by HL or Pop Ansley for short. Ansley was an early amateur radio enthusiast. He uh, founded WKBC, which at the time was only the second or was rather one of two operational radio stations in Birmingham at that time, the other one being WBRC. Ansley was born in Sulphur Springs in 1879 to a large family. His father worked for the local railroad, I believe as a track inspector, but was killed when Ansley was just uh, four years old. He had an older brother named Bill who sort of took him under his wing, and Ansley actually followed his brother Bill when he was about 14 years old to uh, the Alaska Gold Rush up in Yukon. Uh, he helped his brother there run a hotel and general store called the Palace Hotel, and for a number of years, he remained there until returning to Birmingham in 1905. He started a career in sales, working for an industrial plumbing company called the Crane Company. They built these large valves for, I think, Alabama power dams. But in his spare time, uh, Ansley was getting involved in the local Birmingham wireless scene. He, he co-founded the Birmingham Wireless Association with a few other enthusiasts in 1908, and the purpose of the club was really to connect amateurs together and uh, attract newcomers to the field and ultimately help each other shoot or uh, troubleshoot technical problems they were having with their equipment. They also had, or at least worked closely with, a junior wireless club to attract young people into the field. And really in these days when not that many Alabamians owned or even had access to radio, these amateur clubs were critical in sustaining and ultimately spreading the medium of radio. Ansley worked his way into voice broadcasting in 1915. Uh, that's when he received his first amateur license, which was one of the first few thousand in the country, actually. This is his setup circa 1915 or so, and it was in the basement of his house in the Fountain Heights neighborhood of Birmingham. So Ansley participated in these contests to uh, see who could receive the most distant signals. So in 1916, there was one where he actually made the paper for receiving signals from Jefferson City, Missouri, and uh, Battle Creek, Michigan as well. Unfortunately, his hobby had to take a hiatus during America's entry in the First World War. Uh, he had to have shut down his station at least until 1919. That's because the American government was very afraid of amateurs participating in the war on the side of the Germans and you know, being spies, essentially. Uh, interestingly, though, a lot of amateur enthusiasts would donate their equipment to the military because the equipment they had built themselves was actually better than what the military had in many cases. And in any case, the American military was desperate for pretty much everything in the form of equipment in 1917, and they were keen to get what they could get. The uh, next instance, or rather first post-war instance we have of Ansley's involvement in radio came in 1921, and that's when he was elected president of the Birmingham Wireless Association. But by 1924, though, Ansley was interested in upgrading his equipment and really starting a commercial broadcasting station. So he found a transmitter, a guy named Tom Brown had built it when he was still in high school. And uh, beyond that though, he was really struggling to make it through the regulatory hoops of the, uh, to, to get his station licensed. At this point, there was only one real federal regulation of radio. That was the Radio Act of 1912, it put the Department of Commerce in charge of regulating licenses and stations and things like that, but they were completely swamped. Uh, they wrote back to him and said that if they gave him uh, permission to uh, operate a license or operate a radio station, it would just open up this floodgate of about 500 other applicants that had uh, applications on their desk just from the South alone. 
So they told him the best thing he could do was simply to wait for somebody to give up their license. He would then get in line and eventually, one hopes, would get a license. That didn't really stop Ansley, though. It didn't deter him. He, he fought for two years to get it, enlisted the help of a state senator. And critically, he was able to point out that under a Department of Commerce rule, they would give licenses to stations that already had stations built. And he technically still had a station built. He had a transmitter for it. He may have had some of the remaining equipment from his 1915 setup. And he was also able to argue that he only really wanted to broadcast for three hours after work when WBRC wasn't broadcasting anyway. They, uh, they finally okayed the station in June of 1926 and gave him the call letters WKBC. So WKBC broadcasted from Ansley's home again in the Fountain Heights neighborhood between 7 and 10 p.m. after he got off work. The uh, transmission of the station was pretty weak. It's hard to determine the exact range just because there's a lot of variables, but apparently it could be heard all around Birmingham. While broadcasting, uh, Ansley's family would receive song requests by telephone, write them down, and his daughter would lower the request down to the basement, and he, uh, he would then play them. He did have some fun with it sometimes. He would sometimes play music from a completely different genre that was requested. Uh, sometimes he would try to get radio parts from his audience if he was having any technical issues with it. He was still a hobbyist at heart, and he had, and he had a lot of fun. By 1928, though, Ansley sold his station to the R.B. Browles Furniture Company. Uh, they moved the station to a balcony in their store and broadcasted from there, most likely using it as an advertising medium for their own store. This was kind of before the days when the commercial and money-making aspects of radio broadcasting had really been fleshed out. So a lot of these companies would found radio stations mostly to promote themselves as opposed to selling airtime to other advertisers. The Birmingham News then bought the station from the furniture company in 1932 and changed the call letters to WSGN, which stands for South Greatest Newspaper. It was actually a play on the Chicago uh, Tribune's radio station, station WGN, which stood for World's Greatest Newspaper, so only a step down from Chicago. WSGN had a very long history after this. Uh, some of you all are probably familiar with it. It was very big in the 1950s through the 1970s. And they did not sign off until 1986 when uh, they had their last message with Vera Lynn's rendition of We'll Meet Again, which turned out to be accurate because as recently as a month ago, a new station was arriving those call letters for a classic station in Birmingham. So it carries on. But back to Ansley. Uh, he, he didn't completely leave radio behind him after he sold the station. Presumably, he still was involved in the hobbyist scene. And after he retired in around 1946, he moved to St. Augustine, Florida to help his uh, friend John C. Bell, who was the founder of WBRC, uh, build the radio station WFOY in St. Augustine, which uh, stood for Fountain of Youth. His last stint in radio came in 1951. Uh, he broadcasted over WSGN for its 25th anniversary, and afterwards he finally did retire back to Florida to grow grapefruit and Japanese cherries. Our last pioneer is named Ernest House. He was a tinkerer, inventor, and founder of Birmingham's only radio manufacturer of the 1920s. Uh, contemporaries describe this man as having more curiosity than 14 cats. He would do things like build his own motorcycle and, critically for our purposes, experiment with electronics. His specific contribution to radio was a circuit that allowed a radio to be controlled with a single dial. Now, as you can see with this earlier radio house is holding here, most early radios in the 20s, especially the early 20s, had three dials to control it. And they didn't really have any station markers like we would recognize today. They were more graduated numbers from zero to 100. They look sort of like combination locks. You would dial in each one to get the exact station you wanted, and then you would simply write it down to uh, be able to find the station again. I, I don't want to oversell how difficult that is, but obviously the process worked. It was a very precise way of tuning. And with a little bit of practice, you could certainly find stations with the three dial method, but there were still a lot of variables with it. Different antennas would give you different results on the stations. And uh, by the mid twenties, there was definitely an established demand for a simpler means of tuning. The earliest methods of this involved mechanical means of connecting one dial to the other two which apparently was not as precise. It was very difficult to line up the dials correctly. So House decided to take a slightly different approach. He relied on what's called a regenerative circuit to recall or to change multiple dials. And this basically means that some of the electricity from the, the output of the circuit was brought back into the circuit. And then that electricity was used as a way to control or allow the dials to be controlled by that first dial. 
So they could sort of tune themselves just with one dial. Oop. House and a few other colleagues created the Radio Products Corporation to market the idea. Uh, he, he received a patent for his circuit, which he called the Superflex circuit, and he named all of his radios after it there. Uh, he received the patent in 1927, I should say, but he began manufacturing a little bit before that. All of the radios produced by the Radio Products Corporation were hand-built. Uh, they used a mahogany uh, casing and a nice Bakelite frame that sort of has a theater curtain motif. We have one upstairs that you're uh, certainly more than welcome to come and see. The, uh, he also developed this speaker horn on top of his workshop that he would use to play transmissions that he received or play broadcasts that he received from the Superflex radios. This was apparently quite popular, and in the case of the 1927 Dempsey uh, Tunney match, heavyweight championship, apparently hundreds of people gathered around this station to listen to it. By 1929, uh, House was interested in, of course, selling more radios, and he tried to get a state contract. He wrote to Governor Bibb Graves a proposal to, for the state to purchase several hundred radios to, uh, for Alabama, or, uh, Graves' Alabama School of the Air concept. This was a very ambitious plan to put a radio in each accredited high school in Alabama. Uh, so they could listen to broadcasts from WAPI, which at that time was run by API or Auburn at the University of Alabama and the Alabama Women's College at Montevallo. So they specialized in educational broadcasting. That was the core part of their mission or a core part of their mission. So they wanted to broadcast to high schools. It was a little bit of a tough sell because Graves wanted the county boards of education to take the lead on that and preferably receive donations of radios instead of uh, spending state money on it. And in any case, it was not successful. Uh, any idea that the state would expend that kind of money to uh, buy radios for its schools pretty much died with the economic realities of the Great Depression. The uh, Radio Products Corporation largely followed the economy's downward trend. At $80 per set, that was the, the price of their entry line model. It was a mid-range price, but it was still about twice as expensive as most of the cheaper models that were available to people as well, and just beyond the reach of many Alabamians. And I don't believe their production quotas ever quite reached a level where they could compete nationally or even regionally. And by 1932, business was so bad that House was not selling radios as much as he was trading them for goods and service. There was one anecdote where he gave a radio to a dentist so he could get his daughter's teeth fixed. Only two of these Superflex radios are known to exist today. Both of them are in the collection of the Alabama Historical Radio Society. And as I mentioned, they were kind enough to loan us one, so you can see it in the exhibit upstairs. I guess I should also mention the, the technical matter of the Superflex circuit. You might say that the reason House wasn't really able to profit from this further, or the reason why other engineers didn't pick it up, was that he found a great solution to a problem that was solved by other solutions, and it really diminished its significance. Uh, by the late 1920s, the most advanced radios relied on what's called superheterodyne circuits, which only require two tuning knobs, one for the station and the other for uh, adjusting the antenna. From what I understand, further developments towards a single dial radio uh, focus more on adjusting the antenna to make it a little bit easier on that front. So still, by the standards of the day, the Superflex circuit was very much ahead of its time. By way of conclusion, the, uh, the early decades in radio engineering must have just been incredibly exciting times to be involved with the new medium. I mean, yes, radio represented this novel and relatively inexpensive form of communication, but and also, in other ways, it was an opportunity for people to contribute to this growing field. Uh, with the benefit of living through our own segment of the information age, it's kind of easy for me to see parallels between Ansley and House and people creating computer programming and computer hardware uh, businesses, essentially, in the, their basement or otherwise by humble means. And I suppose as a Yale PhD, DeForest sort of flies in the face of that. But even he was attracted to the field largely because he saw that an individual could make a contribution to it. Alabama cannot necessarily claim the largest or the most famous manufacturers, but I think that if we focused only on those largest and best, we would miss an important point about radio in this period of history. And that's that its low financial bar, and in those days its technical immaturity, allowed for innumerable, if relatively small, contributions to the medium's development. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you'll all come up and see the exhibit and uh, join us for future radio moments. Happy to field questions now.
time for some questions and also from our virtual audience. Uh, if you would like to submit your questions in the comments, we'll be able to ask them to Sam. So thank you, Sam, for that wonderful presentation. Anyone have any questions? Yes, Doc. Radio product. How much does the radio cost? I was really thinking about Franklin Roosevelt and fireside chats. Do people have radios? Radio ownership in the beginning of the 1930s in Alabama, I believe, was right at 10%, maybe a little bit lower. By the 40s, about 50% of households had access to radio, whether that meant that they owned one themselves or they, um, they otherwise had access to one, easy access to one. Uh, I mentioned the Superflexes started at about $80. I believe that's about $500 in today's money. So quite expensive, <laughs> about, about what a laptop computer would cost, say. Um, a lot of what they did was they had neighbors that didn't have radio, they'd all get the radio like it was something to see. <laughs> right. And, talk. and so that's how a lot of them were able to get moved. I have the radio that my very nice. And so, Justin, for our virtual audience, so you could hear, um, they, what they would do is they would gather around the radio. So you would have a, maybe one neighbor who owned a radio and other neighbors would come in and be able to listen. It became kind of a communal thing. Um, and then what was the second part that you said? Oh, I just said I had the radio that was, it was a short one. It had short wave on it. Yes. Had short wave on it. You could listen all over the world. And that's how a lot of them were. And so it kind of became not just an individual activity, but a communal one as people could gather together and you know listen to the radio, or maybe even see the radio, if you will, um, because as the things were going on, they could imagine it in their minds together. Well, I have one question for you, if sure, you don't mind me asking. So, of course, there is a lot of beautiful radios upstairs, most of which are on loan from the Alabama Historic Radio Society. Uh, we also have some on loan from Mark Bendixson. Which one's your favorite and why? My favorite is the uh, Spartan Model 557. It's this very pretty Art Deco cobalt glass radio. Uh, it's very eye-catching, very pretty. Yes, that's the one, if you saw any of the advertisements, that's the one that we used in it. So and we definitely, um, I think at the archives, found ourselves very attracted to that one. Definitely a collective staff favorite. I'll tell you one more thing. Since cars were a big deal then too, they did a lot of radios, tabletop ones, that the front of it looked like part of a car. That's right. We also have a, a Crosley dashboard radio that's kind of a similar motif. Is it really? Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful radios. Well, if we have no further questions, thank you all so much for coming and joining us in this first Alabama Radio Moments. This is not the last, it's just the first in many. I hope you come next month as Dot Moore is going to tell us about the Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling fight and how it played out over the radio. So please join us for that next month uh, in person and virtually. And to our in-person audience, I highly encourage you to go up right now to see our exhibit. And Sam is going to go up and be able to answer any questions that you have. Um, and our virtual audience, I highly encourage you to come uh, to see the exhibit. It'll be open through May, 2023. So thank y'all so much.